Life Audio. Christian Parent Crazy World with Katherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you be a godly parent in an ungodly world. I am your host, Katherine Seegers, and in today's episode, we will tackle this vitally important question. How do we establish safe boundaries for our kids' entertainment? Mm, Yeah, media is bombarding our children at every turn. And at the same time, the generation gap is widening. My special guest today, Dr. Walt Mueller, specializes in understanding the next generation, their thought processes, their challenges, and the many ways that entertainment and media are bombarding their lives with deeply concerning messages. If we don't disciple our kids, moms and dads, our culture will. And entertainment is a primary way our culture will do that. So today we are talking about the threats that our kids face from the entertainment world and how we can protect them. That's the plan for this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World. So let's get started. So about our guest today, Dr. Walt Mueller is the founder and president of the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, which is a nonprofit organization serving schools, churches and community organizations around the world and their efforts to strengthen families. I love that. Walt has been working with young people and families for over 35 years. Some of you haven't even been around that long. (laughs) And he has become a recognized authority on youth culture, family issues, and all things having to do with teens and their world. He is also the host of the Youth Culture Matters podcast, phenomenal podcast. I really enjoy it myself. And he has some serious street cred with a Master's of Divinity and a doctorate in postmodern generations from Gordon Cromwell Theological Seminary. Oh, and he has four kids and six grandkiddos, which gives him a lot of up close and personal practice at understanding the next generation. That is what you need to know about our eminently qualified guest today. So let's jump right in. Walt, it's so good to have you on Christian Parent Crazy World. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this. I know. Third time's a charm. That's right. We had a little trouble connecting. I got sick and then you had uh, all kinds of internet outages, but we are here. Third time worked. I'm so glad to have you here. So for my audience, I want to let them know I met you recently at a conference that you gave here in town on the topic of biblical truth and on sex and gender in today's world. It was simply awesome. I enjoyed every minute of it. We connected there and we set up a plan to get you on Christian Parent Crazy World. So why don't we start with you sharing a little bit about your background? Sure. You are the the founder and president of the Center for Parent and Youth Understanding. So what made you want to start an organization that helps kids and parents to understand each other better? Yeah, well, it it really, I you know, in a worldly way of speaking, it came out of nowhere, but it was divine providence, right? <laughs> uh, so I was a youth pastor, and I was a youth pastor for years. I was working outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, and this was in the mid to late, well, the mid, we started there in the mid-1980s, and we were very intentional about working with parents. We understood, biblically speaking, that it's... It, Parents are the ones who are primarily responsible for the spiritual nurture of their kids. That's the way it works out. Right. Biblically, that's how it's supposed to be in the data, which is pretty amazing and not surprising, but it confirms that fact. So we were intentional about coming alongside parents. We spent a lot of time with students, but we wanted to help parents as well. One aspect of that that they reached out to me about what this group of parents was, they said, hey, we've got a problem. We don't understand our kids. We grew up in a world that's markedly different from the world that they're growing up in. So imagine this, Catherine. I mean, it's the mid-1980s. MTV is about five, six years on the scene. Music is having a profound impact on kids in ways it never had before. 
simply because kids are now not just listening to it, they're watching it as well. Right. So they're hearing lyrics, but seeing stories. And, you know, some of the things that they were hearing and seeing were were good when we when we think about, you know, we could affirm those things biblically. But much of what they were seeing and hearing was driving them away from the Christian faith or things that are good, true, right, and honorable. And I think that was really what was behind a lot of this. P- parents were concerned about this. They were concerned about a lot of the new pressures that were ramping up the kids were facing as well. And they're just saying, look, you're with the kids. Help us understand. We we realize that if we are the ones to be responsible for their nurture, we're, we're in one world, they're in another. So in effect, what they were saying was, help us be the cross-cultural missionaries that we need to be. Mm-hmm. And so I initially, I was thrilled they asked me that question, but I was much more comfortable as a younger guy being with kids. You know, now we were intentional about being with parents, but now they're asking me to spend time with them and to teach them. And so it's a little bit hesitant, but it was clear to us that this was something we had to do. So I started to meet regularly with parents week to week for about an hour to shot over a course of three or four months to just help them understand, you know, each week, one particular aspect of youth culture. What was amazing to me was that particular group grew in number each week because other parents would hear about it and they'd say, man, I need this too. So they would come and join us. So that was good because typically, right, when we when we teach, you start with a bigger group and then it just sort of dwindles down. But this thing was growing. So I knew it was hitting a nerve. It was not me. It was hitting a nerve. The students, I was afraid they were going to come back to me and be a little bit angry, right? Like, how dare you? We thought you were our friend. Why are you pulling back the curtain on our world, letting our parents know what we deal with? But they came back and they said, you know, this last week, I had some conversations with my parents about things that mattered. Mm. And the good part of this was we were seeing that God's order and design is God's order and design. It's what we've been created for. And, you know, maybe I had assumed that something good might not come out of this because parents and kids, you know, the generation gap, that sort of thing. But what we saw was there's a cultural generational gap that people on both sides want to have closed. Ah, yes. And that's because kids wanted their parents involved in their lives and parents knew that they needed to be involved in the lives of their children and teens. So all that to say, that's the background. And around 1989, after we'd done this for a while, I was speaking, my wife and I were talking about this and I said, you know, this is hitting a nerve with people. Is it? Is it possible that God could be calling us to you know, start a ministry that would just address this. And long story short, after about a year of really praying through this and asking a lot of people for advice and guidance, and then my wife finally saying, you know, what are you waiting for? It's pretty obvious, <laughs> uh, which is, by the way, that's, that's I, I tell people in youth ministry all the time, I spend a lot of time with people in youth ministry, you know, listen to your spouse, please. God has given you the the spouse that you need to have. Mm -hmm. And so we said, okay, let's go. And so for 35 years now, we've been doing this through the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, working to help parents and youth workers, counselors, pastors, teachers. I mean, it's a whole gamut of people now understand this changing youth culture so that we can reach young people with the gospel and train them for what we call biblically faithful whole life discipleship. Mm. Because the Christian faith is not just about coming to Jesus. It's about following Jesus after Jesus brings us into a relationship with himself. And that and that following goes to every nook and cranny, every square inch of life. So it's a you know, our kids are swimming in this culture. Mm -hmm. And it's the what what I say about it is it's catechizing them. You've heard me say this, right? Catechizes them 24 seven. And isn't that what we're to be about with Christian education and Christian nurture? So it really is. We don't demonize the culture. We see, we understand culture is something made by God. Wherever there are people, there is culture. There are wonderful things in culture. But like everything else in life, culture is marred by sin. And there are huge, huge landscapes of fallenness and danger. And they're very enticing to our kids. And the enemy wants nothing more than to undo our kids. 
and undo our families. And so this is why we do what we do at the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. So a lot of what you heard when I was down there and you were part of that group with your family, education for parents and families, and a lot of work with youth workers and others as well. Mm-hmm. That's us. That's awesome. Yeah, I would. I could have been in your youth group back in the eighties. I remember when MTV came out. Yeah, I'm old. Yeah, I am. I'm. I'm up there too. But um, the the Friday night videos. I remember that whole oh, yeah. transformation. And and parents, I know, were like, "This is not the world that we lived in." You know that they grew up in. We had all of this stuff coming into our homes, piping into our homes that they were unfamiliar with. How much more now? Yeah, I'm like, I. It's so. The lightning speed of technology advancing. I remember I was a junior in college before we had a computer lab at my university. You know, laptops, tablets, all of the devices that we have. I was an adult before I had a cell phone. So it is so hard for those of us. I know I have a lot of millennial parents. They obviously aren't quite as far removed from Gen X or or, I'm sorry, Gen Z children, but I'm Gen X, your baby boomer. I've got a lot of baby boomer grandparents who listen as well. So this generation gap seems to be widening like (laughs) by the second, like trying to keep up with what our kids are dealing with. So what what can we do then? I mean, obviously your organization is there to help, but what I wanted to dive into today is, you know, we had the MTV back in my generation. That was the big concern that a lot of parents have. Now it's everywhere. It's like, we feel like we're bombarded on every front, every device and kids entertainment. You had a really wonderful, healthy section in the conference on what our kids are facing in the entertainment field and how the agenda being driven there is is one that we as parents have to be very aware of and very proactive with, don't we? Yeah. And this is one of the things we say now that I, I want to back up a minute and say that group of parents that I talked about, you know, from back in the 1980s, they they are like the group of parents you're working with now for the most part who would say, we need some help, right? We yeah. We know that something has to happen. We know that there are influences here. I want to say this as well, that I have over the years run into folks in the church who, or parents in the church who kind of swing to the other side and go, you know what? It's just music. It's just media. I had one woman say to me, this is how old I am, right? I had one woman say to me back in the, in the uh, early 1990s, she raised her hand and asked, was like, why are you talking about all this stuff? We had Elvis and we turned out okay. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, now who's to be the judge of, how, of whether or not we turned out OK, because that's all relative. Right. But her basic statement was, look, we, let's just let's just let nature take its course. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when we do that, that's an opposite error in the sense that we're not taking responsi- or our, our responsibility that we read about in Deuteronomy 6 or Ephesians 6 to nurture our kids, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're not taking that seriously. And what we're doing is, by default, we're allowing the culture to raise our kids. And so what you're asking me about is maybe how do we find a middle ground where we're not completely alarmist or, you know, and we don't discount the things that are good that are out there? Because there are wonderful things. You know, truth, all truth is God's truth. So how do we not, get, you know, make that mistake? But how do we not make the opposite mistake? Again, you know what? Just let them grow up. It's just a stage. And so this is where I tell parents all the time that, first off, you know, you have to be steeped in God's word because there's no way to have wisdom and discernment. There's no way to be able that you can tell right from wrong, uh, truth from error. You just can't unless you're growing in your knowledge of God's word. And that never ends, right? That's not a once and done thing. But then you have to also know the culture. It's not just God's word. It's the world. And so this is where, with so much out there, you know, so when you were growing up, you know, if you had been in my youth group, you would have watched MTV. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all I would have needed to have done is track with what you're seeing on MTV. Now we've got these smartphone devices. Right. And we've got, if I could say it this way, MTV times infinity. Yeah. And everybody's going down their own rabbit holes. There's so much out there, you can't keep up with it. And this is where I say to parents, One thing you need to do is find out just through asking questions and observation and monitoring your kids, 
Where are they spending their time? Mm -hmm. What are they reading? What are they listening to? What are they watching? And then what you need to do is read it, listen to it, and watch it. This doesn't mean that you support what is being taught in there, but it's, it's an awareness you have now where you can come alongside them and think with them rather than just saying, turn everything off, right? And there are things we need to turn off, no doubt about that. Right. But think with them through their teenage years to train them for independently thinking to the glory of God themselves as they get older. And if we don't practice that, where we walk alongside them and say, hey, you know, I, you're, you're looking at this, you're listening to this, you've watched this, let's talk about that. You know, basically what's going to happen is they're going to grow up and they're not going to have skills in discernment, nor will they have the wisdom to be able to tell right from wrong. So think of adolescents, your, your kids, the adolescent themselves, as a walking question mark, trying to find out answers to all sorts of questions. Who am I? What do I believe? Where do I belong? You know, who are my, who are my friends? Think of that. And, and this is an opportunity for you now to answer all those things, because if you don't, from the, the, from the pages of Scripture, the culture will answer those things by default, because all kids are asking those questions, and they're extremely vulnerable, not just as little children when they believe anything an adult says, but as teenagers when they're trying to sort out, you know, reality and find answers for themselves, because they're now able to think, not fully developed in ways that, you know, God has designed them to uh, cognitively think. That doesn't happen until about 25 or 26 years old, the research tells us. But I, I say to parents, I don't know if you heard me say this, but, you know, the last part of the brain to develop is the frontal lobe, which is the part responsible for decision-making and impulse control. We have to, we can't think that once our kids hit the teenage years, let's just let them go. Mm -hmm. I think we as parents, we as grandparents need to step in, walk alongside them and be there as their frontal lobe, right? Exercising wisdom and discernment and teaching them. And the problem is that a lot of our kids don't like that Mm. uh, because they want to just think on their own. This is why I think there's so much you know, stereotypical conflict between parents and teenagers. And I had it, you know, with my parents and there was a bit of that with my kids. So, yeah. So that's kind of a long answer to your question. (laughs) I like it. It is a long answer to your question. (laughs) It's great. There's so much to unpack there. You know, you were talking about the woman who's just kind of like live and let live with the culture. I just did a couple of episodes on things that we could learn from the book of Daniel with a pastor named D.J. Harry. And we were talking about, I mean, that's what happens when you just let people go, when we let our kids go along with the culture. There were only four young men in that Babylonian lost culture. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Only four that really stood up to that culture. All the rest bowed. So if we just have a live and let live and, okay, I had Elvis and his swiveling hips and I turned out okay, which, like you said, did you really? We don't know. That's not up for me to decide. Yeah. But just this live and let live idea with the culture, then we are likely not going to be raising the Daniels, the Shadrachs, the Meshachs, and the Bendigos. We're going to be raising the ones that bow to the golden idol of our culture. But I love what you also said. We're not alarmist. There are good things out there. And as I was reading your CPYU blog, the latest one on teens and social media, I saw that you and I have something in common that we both love in terms of entertainment. One of my very favorite shows, if not my favorite show on TV, is All Creatures Great and Small. I adore that show. And actually, I've watched it with my oldest, my oldest daughter. She, It's so refreshing, so lovely, so heartwarming. And you said in that, I loved what you put in there. This is what you said. This week, as I was cataloging all that attracts me to the show, uh, All Creatures Great and Small, I mentioned to Lisa, that's your wife, right? Yes, Lisa's my wife, yeah. Uh-huh. A couple of things that are noticeably absent from the lives of James Harriet and his Derby crew. Televisions, computers, and smartphones. It's fun to watch the story unfold with characters who don't know what they're missing, yeah. but who live absolutely full lives as a result of not having those things. And part of me wants to take our tablets sometimes and our computers and our 
iPhones and chuck them into the to the lake. I wish we could go back. I am so jealous of James Harriet. And this is a masterpiece theater show for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, All Creatures Great and Small. It's it's adapted from literature. It's adapted to his from- books. Yeah, that's actually yeah. true. He's he was an actual person. Yeah. And and the stories are just I, I just I absolutely love it. Yeah. But and there are some good shows out there. Oh, yeah. That's a bit more mature. You're not going to get your six-year-old or probably your eight-year-old or maybe even your 12-year-old into it, although they might be, especially if they love animals because he's a he's a veterinarian. But there are some good things out there. We need to enjoy those things and celebrate those things. But there are some deeply concerning things as well. And I've been doing some research into that. And we do. I, I love your advice. We need to know what they're looking at. Right. We need to engage with it. What what shows are they watching? I have a kid. Uh, I teach a comedy improv class at our homeschool co-op. And not a week goes by that he doesn't mention something from Mr. Beast. Yeah. And I'm like, do the parents know what is happening on that show right now? You're no. familiar, I'm sure. But that that's a great example. Yeah. So I, when I was down there with you folks, I talked a little bit about Mr. Beast. So, yeah. you know, what are our kids watching? And by the way, a lot of, a lot of what they're watching is on YouTube. Yes. So YouTube videos are where they are. Anybody can put a YouTube video up. And it's amazing to me that, you know, I've never believed this, this statement. I, I still don't that in America, if you put your mind to it, you can be and do anything because mm-hmm. that, that's real. That's not true. That's one of the lies that we, right. you know, that's one of the lies we believe. <laughs> I covered that in an episode recently, actually. Can your child be whoever they want to be in life? Um, no, but they can't That's be right. who God has called them to be in life. That's what I, my conclusion. Yeah, yeah. So, but I will say this, like recently with YouTube, anybody can be on TV yeah. because you can create a show about yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get a lot of followers, but there are people who do. And these people who get all the followers, which is really social capital for our kids, that's where they find their value and their worth and how many followers they have on social media. These people are making millions of dollars as well, some of them, because they're actually influencers doing marketing for companies that provide items for them to feature on their show or, you know, with some of these kids who are doing these, you know, makeup shows, the makeup brands and things like that. They're actually being paid to do that. So they're commercial in that way. But some of these kids who have really gotten traction are making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And one of these, you mentioned Mr. Beast. And I know when I was down at the conference, I used him as an example right now. So just a little bit of history on this. If you're not familiar with Mr. Beast, this is a guy who's a YouTube celebrity. And he started way back, way back, right? 12 years ago, 2012, making these videos, putting these videos up. So his name's Jimmy Donaldson. He's 24 years old. I've got a bunch of notes here on him just so I don't miss anything. And he does these videos that kids like and parents trust because they're they're seemingly innocent. You know, pranks, jokes, stunts, competitions, things like this. It was, and I think it still may be, it may have jumped up a little bit from this, but it was about a year ago, the fourth most subscribed YouTube channel. Millions and millions upon millions of subscribers to this. So he, like this, this guy wasn't even on commercial TV. And if you go back the last couple of years to the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards, and by the way, Nickelodeon, Mm. they would say their target audience, editorial speaking, is ages two to 17. So when they pull in marketers to advertise on a Nickelodeon network, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, they're saying, look, people who are watching are 2 to 17, but that trend's on the lower age. I don't know many 17-year-olds Watch, who are watching yeah. Nickelodeon. They're watching other things, right? Right. So they do a thing called the Kids' Choice Awards. He won the Favorite Male Creator Award twice in 2022 and 2023. Hmm. And in 2023, fasten your seatbelt for this. This is what is amazing to me about how the world's changed. This is a YouTube star who, like, has created his own YouTube channel. He was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. Wow. I mean, what, I mean, when you think oh. about all the people in the world who are influential, yeah. so even Time Magazine, you know, recognizes this. And I think parents need to sit up and wow. take care. All right, so now I want to know, 
Okay, so kids kids love Mr. Beast. Now, I may say to my kids, you know, you're not going to watch Mr. Beast because you don't have a smartphone. You're not going to have access to YouTube. You're not going to see it. But your kids are going to mix and mingle through the course of their daily day, whether they're in a homeschool group, a Christian uh, school, right. or a Christian school, in a public school, out on the playground. They're going to mix and mingle with those who, you know, rub elbows with those who watch Mr. Beast right. and influenced by Mr. Beast. Now, remember, kids are, and I want to just say this, developmentally, our kids are seeking answers to three basic questions. Uh, and these are developmental tasks. One is identity formation, trying to figure out who am I? Mm-hmm. And the options out there right now are unbelievable. In Endless. Terms, you know, to find it, you know, and a lot of that, a lot of that now narrows down to sexuality and gender, because that's a big part of the yep. cultural narrative, that who you are is who you feel you are regarding your sexuality and gender, not who you've been made to be, right. but who you feel you are, all right? Now, that's going to play into this in a minute. So that's the first thing. And let's let's just think about not teenagers, but children right now who believe anything an adult says. Mm. So they're watching, you know, Mr. Beast. So who am I? Second question, developmental task is uh, worldview formation. That's that's to find an answer. What do I believe? Mm-hmm. And beliefs are shaped at a very young age. That's when they start to be shaped. So when it comes to sexuality, you heard me say this at that conference. Whoever speaks first to a child about matters of sexuality and gender, they set the bar for truth. Yep. In that child's mind, the first thing they hear is what they believe to be true, and everything else that they hear after that will be judged according to that. That is so important right there. That what you just said. Oh yeah, we want to speak first. Yeah. We have to speak first on all of these issues. On I'm, I'm, I have some upcoming episodes on porn. Yeah. Kristen Jensen, she wrote some books, Good Picture, Bad Picture. So you yeah. as the parent with a very young child can start to have the set the set the bar, set the conversation and help them to filter and censor themselves, hopefully, to understand because they're going to come in contact with it. Yeah, that's it's going to happen. Oh, so, yeah. But it's, I love what you said there. I want to just emphasize that for parents. We have to set the bar because we have to speak first on topics of sexuality. We have to speak to first on topics of like pornography and the other issues that they're dealing with in this culture. If we don't, we are playing catch up and and they've already got something else in their head established as the truth. And then we're coming and trying to correct it. Yeah. And you've handicapped yourself you've handicapped yourself if you're late to the table here we have got to be proactive as parents i I just wanted to emphasize that keep going please yeah yeah and if i can if i can just tag something onto that that you know part of the issue is that we sometimes are very naive and we think our Mm -hmm. kids aren't going to face these things well they do yeah and you know it's uncomfortable for us because that's the second thing we weren't taught well Mm-hmm. Or our parents didn't know how to do this. So so now we have no training in how to do this. We think it's not going to hit our kids. Mm-hmm. But then when push comes to shove, we go, you know, what do I say? How do I say it? When do I mm-hmm. say it? The good thing is that right now there are publishers out there and people out there who are putting out some wonderful resources yes. for parents of the smallest children there. Yes. On, about who made them, about the difference between boys and girls, about you know, gender, about sexuality in age appropriate ways. And so those are there there are helps out there for us. But we have to talk about things at younger and younger ages because your kids are going to come to you and they're going to ask, you know, my 10 year old grandson, he asked me, well, we had a conversation when he was six years old because of a TV show Mm -hmm. that, you know, he said, what is transgender at six? Now, how do you explain that to a six year old? But you have to. You have to. And then. Yeah, more recently he was I was he was getting ready to go to bed and we prayed together and he said, Papa, can I ask you a question? Ten years old, he goes, What is pansexual? Mm. And you know, what does that mean? And so my first question to him was, Where did you hear that? Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, YouTube. And so he heard this on YouTube. And so we had, I'm glad he brought it up. Mm-hmm. Because now we were able to have a a conversation about things and frame things within God's creational design Mm -hmm. and explain, you know, within that, you know, what's happening in the culture. So, 
you know, that's a that's a big thing. So so let me go back to so those three things, you know, the uh, developmental questions, you know, who am I? That's identity formation. The second one, worldview formation, what do I believe? And the third one is where do I belong? Mm-hmm. And that's your relational formation, mm-hmm. you know, about what group. And by the way, whoever we spend time with, those people are going to be an influence on us. Mm-hmm. And so this is where we need to be praying for our kids to engage with those who are older and peers as well, who are people of faith. And so that uh, the things that we're teaching them in the home, and I trust we're teaching them, nurturing them in the faith, they're going to they're going to hear every, anywhere. So all that to say, let's go back to Mr. Beast. I'm yes. Just frame the conversation. <laughs> People may be wondering if they yeah, haven't heard what yet happened, what's happening there. <laughs> yeah, what happened to Mr. Beast? So the reason I bring this up is, imagine you have a seven-year-old boy who just is watching Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast. And for a long time, parents have assumed that, you know, this is safe. Mm-hmm. Well, he's had this longtime sidekick, Chris Tyson, a guy named Chris Tyson, who's known to the kids. And Chris Tyson, just about a year ago, revealed that he had started hormone replacement therapy because he was going to transition from male to female. So now the transgender agenda is there. He's married, he has children, and he's still on the show. And they're watching and hearing the transition, and it's all, you know, being normalized. Now, so I will share this with people, and a lot of them who are you know, have been aware of Mr. Beast for a long time, are now shocked. But this is why I say, stay up on what's happening in the world of your kids in terms of what they're listening to, what's what they're watching, what they're reading. And take time to listen to it, to watch it, to read it, because that's going to provide you with teachable moments and occasions for teaching truth to answer lies or to affirm truth that they're seeing and hearing already. And so we want to point that out As I said earlier, all truth is God's truth. So we want to, you know, affirm that when we see that and when we hear that. And and I'll say this as well, Catherine, that it's important for us when we have these conversations that involve real flesh and blood people, that we always affirm the dignity and value of human beings because everyone's God is one of God's image bearers. And even though sin and brokenness may express itself in a way that we find really disheartening, we can maybe remove those influences from our kids' lives, especially when they're younger. You know, we build those fences and borders and boundaries. But we do want to affirm that these are people who are made in God's image and, you know, have a posture towards them that's one of of grace while not sacrificing truth. We have to have that balance. That's a yes. Thank you for mentioning that. It's so true. We always want to maintain the dignity of people that we disagree with. Yes. And not obviously the ideas are threatening, but we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We always have to remember that it's not the flesh and blood. It's the powers and the principalities behind that, the ideas behind that. I wanted to touch on a couple of other areas of concern that parents just I I just want to mention a few. I got this list from Romper, which is a website that celebrates all types of LGBTQ storylines. So this is, it, it would not be a, a parenting resource I would recommend other than they they identify shows that they believe are good in terms of right. expressing LGBTQ storylines. They mentioned that Arthur, the TV show, kids animated TV show. I know my kids have seen that in the past. It features a gay wedding, Madagascar, a little wild, uh, closed out season three with a character named Odie Elliot, who doesn't know what kind of animal they are using pronouns, except for being a party animal. That's the only thing this particular animal knows, doesn't know what kind of animal. So Obviously, getting into gender ideology there. Chip and Potato is a show that has two gay dads. My Little Pony, season nine, features a lesbian couple. Rugrats, Phil and Lil's mom is a lesbian. Doc McStuffins episode has an episode called The Emergency Plan. It features a lesbian couple. Ridley Jones has two dads. Again, we want to be compassionate about people who are actually dealing with this, but this is so agenda driven at very young ages. And if you don't know that this is in there, it's being normalized for kids. I can remember with my oldest, who is now 19, I think she was in second grade, and it came 
we we had to have the conversation about that from a source I never imagined. It was House Hunters. I was watching an episode yeah. of House Hunters. It wasn't even kids programming, but it wasn't what I considered to be at that point. This was goodness. 12 years ago, uh, agenda-driven television, but they had a, a gay couple on there and we had to sit down and we did have a compassionate conversation about it. But now, you know, back then it was not in the kids' programming like it is now. We need to know what our kids are watching, what is in there. We need to have those conversations and we need to make sure that what they are watching isn't normalizing something that God call sin that is not God's design for them. Yeah. There's a lot of other lists out there. I ran across a guy named Scott Smith. He had a really cool blog. He is a Catholic attorney, author, theologian, and he has six kids. And he personally reviewed like 53 different TV shows. Another resource that parents should definitely look look at is Plugged In by Focus on the Family. You can kind of go in there and type what you're, you know, if you know your kid likes this show. You can type it in there and they have reviews of those shows and they have a really good list of guidelines, which I'll go over just in a minute at the end of the show. But there's also some Christian subscription services for kids. There's uh, Minnow, Pureflix Kids, Yippee, Shalom World, Faith Life TV. I'll link all of those in the show notes if parents are looking for something where they don't have to be as concerned, although I think you always need to be aware of what your kids are watching. Maybe you want to go that route and just try to find alternate sources of entertainment for your kids so you don't have to worry about it. because it's it may not be every episode, but it can get yeah. in there at some point and we want to have the right conversations with our kids and be aware, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, you know, parents don't don't let your guard down. And what I mean by that is that sometimes when we see our kids move away from certain things that we understand to be dangerous, harmful, leaving an impression that's not a good impression, you know, nurturing them away from truth. And we sometimes go to these other, other, you know, subscription services and things or films or whatnot. Don't let down your diligence there either. Right. And I'm not familiar with a lot of what you just said. So this is not a statement about any of those, but it, it's just a general statement that even if something is labeled Christian, there might be worldview elements that or, or, or bad theology, let's say. Yes. Which we need to be aware of as well. And so this is where immersing ourselves, as I said, in God's word, to be able to discern truth from error. I mean, when you look at just about most of the New Testament letters are letters to correct errors in the church, Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be able to look for and spot errors so that we don't lead our kids into those. Because in the church, I mean, that's that those things are present. And so we have to be ever diligent and and on guard on those things. So there's a balance there as well. And I know that may not sit well with some folks, but, you know, just I mean, I've been doing this long enough that I've seen this. And that's why I, I push that and say, be diligent with everything. It's kind of like, you know, people who might think that, well, if I don't have my kids in a public school and I homeschool or I send them to a Christian school or a classical school, we do a ton of work with schools here. I have numerous friends, you know, homeschooling, you know, public school, Christian school. If you get them out of the one that you think is the worst, that doesn't mean that the others are immune to any of the issues and the attitudes. And I just had a conversation yesterday with someone involved with a local Christian school that's extremely conservative and was talking about some of the behavioral issues and lifestyle choices some of the older kids were making. And I think sometimes, you know, when we let our guard down, we just think we got to remember that the biggest thing that our kids struggle with is the biggest thing that we struggle with, and that is our own personal sin. It's what's inside of us, you know, that that so easily that default setting to do the wrong thing because, you know, of sin that we are tempted, you know, to go down roads that we shouldn't go down. So and our kids struggle with that. So training is important no matter where they are. That is so true. And you can't just find that alternate community where you're never going to have to deal with this. <laughs> you can't sanitize their lives so much. Yeah. I wanted to share a few of these recommendations that I found that I think will be very helpful and practical for parents in terms of uh, kids' entertainment, what you might want to implement in your home. I will link these. I got these off of ChristianCourier.com. I thought they were helpful. They recommend that children not watch more than one or two hours a day at the most. I think that's more than enough. 
<laughs> way more than enough. But I love this. Do not permit your children to have a personal TV in their room. They need to watch it under your supervision and you need to monitor what shows so that you know what they're watching so that it's safe. Don't allow them to watch TV at mealtimes. Parents and youngsters, we need to be engaging with our kids and having meaningful conversations at those mealtimes. Don't let them watch TV if they fail to do their homework and their chores. Don't permit your youngsters to spend hours on video games as well. That's going to take a toll on their reasoning skills. I think that's kind of a good starter list that we could do. Do you have anything you would add to that in terms of guidelines? Well, I, I'm just going to say the addictive nature of all these things. We, yes. we get so wrapped up. These things become idols in our lives. And, you know, when they take up time, there's certainly that. But the more time we spend with them, the more time we feel we need to spend with them. Mm -hmm. And there's a growing amount of evidence that's out there, scientific evidence that's pointing to the fact, you know, and for years, people were hesitant to say smartphones are addicting, right? Mm. Uh, but now we're seeing that's the case. And, yep. you know, even to the apps, or we were talking about YouTube just a little while ago, that thing is is created to be addicting. And, it is. you know, if you watch... Um, Oh, The Social Dilemma, the film The Social Dilemma, right? Yes, yes. Where they interview all these folks who are creators of apps and, you know, social media platforms and things. The, the, the greatest message or takeaway we can take from that is that these people made all these things and now they don't let their kids use any of them. Right. That is so true. Because they know, right. you know, how, how much that will, will suck them in. And it's hard on kids. It's hard on us as well, mm -hmm. you know, that it's the same thing for us. And so I always say to myself, your habits will form you. Mm -hmm. And the more you engage in a good habit, the more it will become a good habit you desire to engage in. And the same is true on the opposite side. So, you know, people who exercise and, you know, they go like, I got to run today. All right. That's a good thing. You know, keep keep working. And I think that's the way God made us. Mm -hmm. But the negative things as well, mm -hmm. you know, just as physical activity and good habits, you know, Bible reading, quiet time becomes habitual. You almost become addicted to those things, which is a good mm -hmm. thing. The opposite is true as well with the more negative things. And so. This is where, I mean, I, I can't emphasize enough. Look, you referred to, to Daniel a little bit earlier. And the thing that came to mind when you were telling that story is it only takes a generation to lose a generation. Mm -hmm. And we lose a generation when we're, when we're silent about mm -hmm. things that are good, true, right, and honorable about the truth. Mm -hmm. And we lose a generation when we're making noise through our words and our actions about following that wide road that leads to destruction. And we do that through the poor choices we make as parents as well, because your kids are watching. And none of us gets this perfect, right? This is a yeah. lifelong struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, but awareness, just being aware that this is what's taking place is a, a place to start, a place to stay. I totally agree. I love that you mentioned the social dilemma. That is the perfect segue because we're going to keep you around for another episode where we're going to talk about the impact of social media on our kids. For those who don't know, uh, The Social Dilemma came out in 2020. That was a Netflix documentary. It was really, really powerful and disturbing. It's hard to sleep after watching it. That started with a quote, though, that I wrote down from Sophocles. Nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. <laughs> yeah. So it's vast and there's goodness to be had there, you know, because I was thinking when you were just talking about that. I love that I have my smartphone and I can have it on Amazon Music and I can listen to worship music in my car when I'm out on a run, when I'm, you know, cleaning the kitchen or whatever, or have it in the background while I'm homeschooling. We have access and I've got, I've got so much access. You talked about YouTube. We'll get into this in the next one, but I... I love to sit and watch apologetic videos on YouTube. That's what I get sucked into is I can watch Frank Turek and William Lane Craig and, you know, other apologists just sit there and defend the faith all day. They have these wonderful little 10 to 15 minute videos so I can get sucked into that. It, and I, It's a good thing, except for when I need to be teaching a math lesson or something, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something else. But I, I tend to use it. You can use these things for good. Your kids can use these things for good. They can be a blessing to us. I have gotten so much good training personally on YouTube, and I've figured out how to do things on YouTube, like self-help videos. It's awesome, right? 
there are good things there, but they're also deeply concerning things, particularly with our kids who may not have the proper filters. And we need to be, I love how you put it. We need to be the frontal lobe for them yeah. and help them to discern what is good and, and beneficial to them and the areas of entertainment and social media and what is not. But we're holding you over because you're so amazing. Thank you for all of this wisdom. I can't thank you enough for joining me in this vitally important conversation about protecting our kids from unwholesome and ungodly sources of entertainment that may influence their thinking and set itself up to be the truth on a topic that we need to bring God's truth to. So this has been so helpful and practical. Why don't you tell our listeners where they can learn more about you all, the Center for Parent Youth Understanding and your podcast, uh, Youth Culture Matters. Yep, it's pretty easy. You just go to cpyu.org. That's our homepage. And if you scroll down, you'll see what all of our resources are. As you mentioned, we do have podcasts. We have a daily one-minute spot called Youth Culture Today where we try to encourage parents, give them hope, give them some nugget of what's going on in the world. And then we do a long-form podcast. There's about We're up to about 190 episodes now. That's called Youth Culture Matters where we have conversations with people, many of whom you've chatted with as well. I saw you had Oz Guinness on recently. Love him. Oz has been on with us and, and others as well, but just on, you know, helping parents understand here's what's happening in the world and how how to respond. So uh, yeah, and we have printed resources. Most everything that's on our website is free, tons and tons of downloads, a lot related to what we've talked about here. One resource I'll point people to is we do a little, we have a little media evaluation guide that parents can use with their kids called How to Use Your Head to Guard Your Heart. And it's a little three-step process that every time you watch or you listen to something, you go through the process of discover what is what is this saying, discern what does God's word say about that, and then decide how do I do I stick with it? Is it drawing me closer to God? Is it pushing me further away? Helping them make good and godly decisions. So all those things are on there, but just go to cpyu.org. Wonderful. I will have all of those links in the show notes. And you have a lot of links in your show notes, too. I spent a lot of time prepping for the next show from your show notes. We are going to be talking about, like I said, another vitally important topic when it comes to our kids' social media. The Surgeon General recently issued a report that should concern us all when it comes to the havoc social media is wreaking in the lives of our kids and possibly in our lives as well. Moms and dads, you do not want to miss this conversation. Thanks again, Walt. I really appreciate you spending all this time with us. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for joining me today. Look, I know there are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you took this time to spend with me. I hope you will join me for my next podcast when we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and sharing it on social media and giving it a good review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and following me on Facebook and Instagram? Oh, oh and maybe you could say that Christian Parent Crazy World is the best podcast you've ever heard in your entire life. Uh, just a thought. Uh, and be sure to check out my website, which is katherinesegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time. Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com.